Thank you so much. Ten years ago, I wrote the Pew Internet Project's first report about healthcare and the social impact of the internet on healthcare. And I called it the online healthcare revolution. Back then, it did seem revolutionary that people had access to information that had previously been locked up and kept out of reach. It was extraordinary that people were able to um, start looking things up and, and taking care of themselves by um, using what they could find on the internet. Ten years later, however, I'm ready to declare that access revolution over, at least in the United States. We have seen um, a real sea change in how people are able to access the information. And I would argue that we need um, a change of our frame of reference. It's no longer about a revolution. It's about building a new civilization on this new frontier. Um, the Mayo Clinic has been a leader during the revolution in opening up your expertise to the world. And you can be a leader as we continue to build on this new frontier um, if you take advantage of the trends that I'm about to talk about. First, some history. In 1995, which, by the way, was not that long ago, only one in 10 American adults had access to the internet. By the year 2000, it was up to 50% of American adults. And we now find that 75% of American adults and 95% of teenagers have access to the internet. Um, however, um, I do want to point out the line at the bottom, that's the 65 plus line, that's the Patch Adams line. Um, and you know, it's not so unusual for someone who is 65 and older to not go online. But the key to remember is that they, many of them have second degree internet access. It's their loved ones who have access. Another revolutionary hurdle was passed when we found uh, broadband access going from 5% of American households to two-thirds of American homes. Broadband changes us as internet users. One of the Pew Internet Project studies found that a dial-up user takes part in an average of three activities per day, while a broadband user takes part in seven. Another uh, revolutionary hurdle that's uh, passed is that 82% of American adults have a cell phone. Six in 10 American adults go online wirelessly on a laptop or a smartphone. This, again, is um, an incredible change. It's almost as if the, the oceans have uh, parted, the landscapes have shifted, and we have come to the other side of a massive shift in communications. In the last 10 years, the internet has moved from being this slow, stationary information vending machine to a fast mobile communications device that fits in your pocket. And it has erased the digital divide. When we add mobile access to our definition of an internet user, the differences between African American adults and white adults disappears. If your information is not available on a small screen, then I would argue it's not available at all to some key audiences. Um, that would include recent immigrants, people with lower levels of education and income, um, and uh, especially young people. It's, it's very important for us to remember where people are today, not where we thought they were five or 10 years ago, but where people are today. So let me give you some more context. Um, how many people remember their favorite class from your first year in college? Mine was Geology 101. It was actually a science requirement. I did not plan to study science, but I knew I had to fulfill the requirement. Um, and my professor knew that most of us were not going to be studying soil samples or rock formations. And so he made it his mission to teach us how to see the landscape in new ways. And his advice makes a lot of sense, and not just for geologists. Know the history of the land you live on. Know the landscape so that you can adapt to it. Geologists are trained to look for patterns, to observe what's happening in the landscape so that they can make predictions and, and help people to adapt to the reality of the landscape. That's what I do today. I'm an internet geologist. And so what I'm going to do is share with you the data 
um, for what I'm seeing and what I'm measuring. So you might ask, where's, where's the biggest change online right now? It's definitely wireless. Wireless access is changing us once again as internet users. We are more likely to um, create content. We're more likely to share. We are starting to see information as portable, personalized, and participatory because of mobile. Text messages are a great example of this. Um, one study in the Netherlands found that when you receive a text message, you um, respond to it with, in three minutes on average. That's an incredible opportunity. Um, I'm starting to think of it as the, the FedEx principle. A FedEx arrives and you open it immediately. Um, a text message arrives and you open it immediately. The other thing to know about mobile is that it's, if you give someone a smartphone, they're more likely to gather information on the go, to share it, and create it. And when you think about um, the FedEx principle, um, think about how it affects teenagers. I, I think you can probably multiply the FedEx principle by a factor of 10 when you're talking about teenagers. Um, and here's an example of how that can be harnessed. We find um, in, in Project Health Design, there was a team of Stanford researchers who wanted to help chronically ill teenagers um, do better with managing their own health as they transition from pediatric care to adult care. So they talked to the teenagers and they found that um, for them, technology is often a comfort, especially if it's portable, like a, an iPod or a cell phone. And um, they also found that teenagers were less likely to take their meds if they were feeling sad or depressed. Um, and so they, they came up with a tool um, to, to, track, um, to track the teenagers' moods by tracking what songs they listen to on their iPods and the words that they're using in text messages. Now you might be thinking, the teenagers agreed to surveillance? How can this possibly be? But yes, they did. They were willing to make the trade-off for two important reasons. One, the researchers were a trusted entity other than their parents. Number two, they were willing to make this trade-off in order to take more responsibility for their health. They knew that they needed to take their meds in order to stay well, and they want to stay well. And so they agreed to this surveillance because they knew that it would help them. These messages were triggered automatically and sent um, to, their, to, to their cell phones and seamlessly integrated into their lives. And they took their meds more regularly, and it didn't have anything to do with mom. We recently did a study which got a lot of headlines, um, which actually focused on that bottom line, the 65 plus group, um, who we see flocking to social network sites like Facebook, MySpace, and LinkedIn. Um, but I'm actually more interested in the top line. 86% of people in their 20s are using social network sites. Now, this might not surprise most of you, but what we believe at the Pew Research Center is that it's important to put numbers on what we think is happening. Um, we provide data, again, so that you can notice patterns and make observations and adapt to the landscape. And one of the ways that I think it's time to adapt is to know that these social network sites and social media in general are becoming information hubs in healthcare as well as in politics, news, and other sectors. People want to learn from each other, not just from institutions. Now, this might surprise you and say, um, it's dangerous that people are learning from each other. What could they possibly be saying to each other um, that would have value? Well, there's good news. People do want to link to authoritative sources. They want to have evidence and science be part of the conversation. So whatever you and your organization can do to seed the online conversation with science, do it. You can't control the conversation, but you can be part of it. Um, 
Another key message is um, that people are, are feeling better because of this. And so they're going to continue to do it. There's, um, there's actually just a wonderful feedback loop that's happening. Um, and this is really not a surprise. If you look at the landscape of human history, um, it's an ancient communal ritual for us to talk to each other. And now technology is, is speeding that up and helping that to happen. Think about what would happen if we could harness our instinct to share with tools that make it easy. We conducted an online survey last year um, and uh, found one person who said, I was having problems sleeping because of hip pain. Through this online health community, I received information about proper ways to set up my bed, and since then have been sleeping so much better. This was a simple change, just how to arrange her pillows. And it was suggested by a peer, and it happened online. Another respondent wrote, I read the gluten-free forum daily for about a year before I really got my celiac disease under control and felt fully informed. You can't call your gastroenterologist every time you buy a new product. That's where healthcare happens. It happens in the grocery store aisle, making a decision about what to have for dinner tonight. And what if that person had access on her phone to the right choices, to the best information at the right time? So about 20% of the online health population um, contributes comments and, um, and basically creates content about health online. And that's the classic Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule. 80% 80 of the audience is listening, 20% is particip participating. But here's where it gets interesting. If you hand somebody a smartphone, they are more likely to become a creator, a contributor. They are more likely to participate in the online conversation. What will happen when the untapped knowledge of every patient, of every caregiver, of everyone who has something of value to share, actually has the opportunity to share it? That's the new frontier. This goes way beyond access. The new frontier is about inputs, it's about uploads. It's about people learning from each other. Patients are not the only ones who can benefit from this new model of participatory medicine. Institutions can benefit as well. Um, E-patient Dave DeBronckhart is a, uh, a high-tech marketer and a cancer survivor. He used CaringBridge um, during his illness to stay in touch with family and friends. He used ACOR um, to access peer expert advice about his type of kidney cancer. And he used Beth Israel's patient site to uh, keep up with his doctors and his treatments. So um, he's also really, frankly, a geek. Um, and so when he had the opportunity to uh, use Google Health through a Beth Israel partnership, he was among the first to press the button and allow his medical record to get sucked into Google Health's online system. Um, unfortunately, as you decipher the slide, I'll tell you that it transmitted everything he'd ever had and some things he'd never had with no dates attached. It also transmitted every medication that he'd ever been on. And it triggered a medication warning that popped up on his screen and scared him. But then he read it and said, well, I haven't had that drug for two years, ever since I was cancer free. Nobody had ever looked at the system. It turns out that Beth Israel was transmitting billing codes, not doctor's diagnoses. Nobody had ever looked at the system until Dave blogged about it, and the story was picked up by the Boston Globe. As an internet geologist, I'm ready to say that Dave DeBronckart was a one-man earthquake for Google Health and Beth Israel. But the good news is that both Google Health and Beth Israel welcomed Dave's critique and have made changes to the system. But I bet they'd wished they'd had a panel of patients go through the system before Dave did. That's the opportunity that we have. 
the opportunity to, to learn from each other as patients and as institutions. So let me wrap up with a couple of thoughts, going back to looking at the landscape and thinking about, um, about where we can go and what the opportunities are. Mobile is changing us as internet users. It's making information personal, portable, and participatory. Healthcare has a marvelous opportunity to build on this ancient instinct to share with each other. Build on the new frontier. Build on the power of mobile. Thank you. <laughs>